In this video, I'll be covering everything that you need in order to successfully M50 swap your E30. This video will be everything you need to know to successfully swap an M50 engine into E30. And if you're swapping a different engine in, the adapter harness is discussed too. <laughs> I'll be covering everything in this video, but let's start first with the engine. The reason behind my engine swap was purely due to the fact that my previous engine, an M40B18, was nearing the end of its life due to poor quality replacement parts, and I had to replace the camshaft and lifters every month. Besides the replacement camshafts being made of a really soft aluminium alloy, the metal shavings were out of control and the airflow meter was on its way out. And the car was also, at the same time, insanely heavy on fuel. So one day, the engine decided it didn't want to like oil anymore, and I took the car back home and decided not to do a second rebuild, but instead decided that the time for an engine swap is now. So after some phone calls with a couple of good friends of mine, I managed to find an M50B20TU engine from an E34 520i with a clean record for the build. Only downside was I had no record of the engine's mileage, but I had a bore scope and some loose screws in my head, and everything went great to the inspection, apart from some crystallized fuel on the valves. Having never done an engine swap entirely by myself and no help, I only started second guessing my ability to do the swap once I was already on the way home with a new engine. Enough about the story time, let's get to the information. So now that you have an M50 engine, there's a couple of things you need and some decisions to make. The most important thing when it comes to mounting the M50 engine is that you get the front mount sump and pick up, especially because the rear mount sump doesn't clear the subframe. If you have the access to, which you definitely should do, would be to replace the rear main seal. Once that's done, one thing that I should have done but wasn't able to was source an M20 flywheel clutch and pressure plate but instead use an M40B18's one just so that I can get the car driving and be assured that I didn't buy a blown engine. The standard E30 transmissions, in my case the 5-speed 318i transmission was a direct fit. So once the rear main seal, flywheel, clutch and pressure plate was in, the gearbox was completely straight. No missing bolts, no alignment issues, dead straight fit. While you have the available space, Make sure that you remove the brake booster, you'll see why shortly. Just a note on clearances. In this stage, the engine is technically ready to be installed, but some forethought would allow you to save some edX, mainly selector rods, throttle cable, and prop shaft. If you have an engine that sits pretty far forward, namely the four cylinder engines, you may want to consider looking at getting a shorter prop shaft and gear linkages. In my case, a DIY, a chassis mount shift and welder up a shorter selector rod. And if you can see how shite my welds are, you wouldn't be surprised to know that it snapped on me. If you're in the US or have any way to order a chassis mount shifter and DSSR like this one from Garagistic, I'd highly suggest you do. Just don't forget to leave the prop shaft last to ensure that you get the correct length one. So now you're pretty much ready to add your M50 engine and transmission ready to mount up, but now you're thinking, how am I going to get this in here and what mounts am I going to use? Well, this is our next topic. So before you get to mounting, there's something that you should do before installing the engine. And if you have a right hand drive E30 like mine, take notes. The steering column and exhaust manifolds will be your biggest clearance slash footprint issue. And if you aren't going to get the set of S52 headers, then you'll need the E39, 528i exhaust branches and to make sure that you don't have a burning steering coupling or worse you'd need to heat the one manifold in this area and hammer it right in to make sure that the clearance is right you might need several attempts to get this done i completely deleted the rubber bushing in my application and my steering is dead solid now take note in my case i do have a bit of vibration back to the mounting so I purchased a set of E36 engine arms and mounts, and for those of you watching this, the only modification I had to do was file down a bit of the dumple on the mount section to make it fit flush of the E30 subframe. And I had reused the M40 engine mount as a spacer or mount in one of the transmission mounts. 
but most often people use the characteristic 24 valve swap transmission mounts which is a far better solution. At this point you are most likely getting really excited to seeing the engine in the car and at this point it's really easy to forget that you need to stop this car. If you didn't know already, you'll need to use a different brake booster. I had purchased the Renault Clio booster but after many weeks of reading up on forums the ease mentions of Golf Mark II GTI brake boosters, Porsche boosters and E90 boosters as well. However E90 boosters are apparently very sensitive and prone to wheel lockup. This is just word of mouth. Your experience may differ. So now you have the booster. Everyone in the grandmother tells you that you need to make sure that the clever spin is exactly the same length as your stock E30 booster or else it won't work. This is only half the truth. If you're going to be using the E30 booster, you need to take a note of the length of the shaft on the inside of the brake master cylinder. If this isn't the same length as your standard booster, You'll spend two weekends trying to figure out why the pedal still does nothing, so measure and adjust till it's just right. Learn from too much people's mistakes. You definitely do not want to be removing the booster with the engine in the car. If you do use a different master cylinder, make sure that the ports are correct as the E90 master cylinder apparently has two ports for the rear brakes, so you'll need to blank one off. So if your hardware besides your prop shaft is pretty much installed, you should decide on which wiring harness and ECU to use. In my case, I completely left this and used the standalone engine management, which I'll do a walkthrough in another video. But all you need to know is that the harness is the Bosch wiring harness, which doesn't have an O2 sensor and ends with an ECU with serial number 413 at the end. Whereas the Siemens ECU makes use of the O2 sensors to accurately measure the air fuel ratio. For now though, if you installed an engine with a wiring harness, it's a good idea to do wire management while you still have the time. Make sure to put the E30 coolant temp sensor in the cylinder head, which is the brown single pin unit, which you will need to use later on for instrument cluster feedback. So now you're nearly there, and now there's one main question. How does the engine talk to the car? Well, you'll need to make an adapter plug. To save all of you a lot of dread, I've made a pinout table from the wire colors from the two E30C101 plugs versus the E34 one I have, made to make sure that my pinout is correct. But just to be safe, double check your wire colors and the plug ends by sliding the rubber boots back to verify. And with some YouTube, shaky hands and a lot of coffee, I was able to solder up my adapter plug and the C101 with the E34 harness complete. It was plug and play. Well, kind of. The adapter harness is great. However, a tip I will give you is that if you are going to be using a standard ECU, you may want to consider pulling up your ECU pinout and find the color wire for e your economy to, to work. If your speed signal is wired incorrect, great, but there's a major plug that you need to wire in, which is the coolant temp sensor. The coolant temp sensor for the E30 is a single pin sensor which uses the engine ground to show where the temperature is at on your cluster, unlike the E34 or E36, which is a two pin plug. Have a look at the pinout and check the right wire color to cut the unused wire. Make sure to double check your oil pressure switch on your wiring diagrams as well. My standalone engine management doesn't have the fuel consumption pulse, but I do plan on using the econometer for something else in the not too distant future. And last, for the wiring, make sure that you have a coding plug for the 6 cylinder E30 to get the correct temperature reading, because if you have the 4 cylinder one, the RPM signal will be incorrect. One final extra piece which gets asked too often on forums such as Reddit, many people after doing their first startup have an issue with the engine dying due to battery drain. And while there is a couple of failure points, the most overlooked yet easiest way to save money is to alternate the ground strap. So this is it. Make sure that you have one 
on a good ground or multiple grounds from both the alternator as well as the engine block or chassis. Otherwise, your alternator won't give the correct charge voltage. So now it's the home stretch. There's a bit of wiring to do here, but now you'll understand just how little space you have. Before anything else, make sure you connect your fuel lines, because you do not want to forget this. If you have all of your rubber hoses and make sure they fit, because you want an engine that can cool itself as much as possible. Because a common failure point on the M50 engines, besides the oil pump chain, or the sprocket that goes on, is a cylinder head warping or cracking due to overheating. If you have enough money, time, and especially contacts that can help you make use of the aircon compressor, you'll be able to adapt the BMW M50 AC compressor to the standard E30 lines. In my case, my AC dried rusted itself, so I did an AC delete, but I made a use of the fan and the bracket. And a good time when mounting those would be to drill out the rivets from the old AC radiator housing and mount the fan to fit it on the radiator. Since I have a really bad experience with cooling systems, and since people don't like using aftermarket electric fans on M50 engines, mostly because the airflow isn't sufficient, I ran a fan controller and instead of running it directly to the fan, I the controller toggle a single pole double throw relay to trigger both electric fans I have. And the system works extremely well. When it comes to radiators, the M40 radiator readily works with the M50 engine, but people have had success with the E36 radiators and quite a few aftermarket applications as well. The main thing to make sure is that all your coolant lines are rooted and don't forget about the throttle body heater pipes and cabin heater core, which is easy to overlook. Once your plumbing is done, it's a great idea to jack the front end of the car up, put your ignition on, and turn your cabin heater to as hot as possible, and switch the car off. Then you add coolant until it reaches the cold point, and make sure your blade screw is out, and you'll purge air out before starting by quickly squeezing the top pipe, blocking the blade screw hole, release the top pipe, and repeat until coolant comes out. And then when coolant comes out, place the radiator cap on and you'll be able to put the bleed screw in without the coolant running back down. Once the bleed screw is in, open the radiator cap, double check that the coolant is at the cold mark. Once done, you can start your engine and let the car idle and keep a close eye on temperatures and the coolant level. You may see a coolant drop from the thermostat opening and purging the air bubbles out by, them by itself, but don't stress. Just fill it back to the cold mark and watch the lever until the pipe feels warm to the touch and you can put the cap back on. You can monitor the temperature gauge to see if it moves and fault find or set up your fan controller. And any issues that you have will usually feed back to the coolant temp sensor wire not being correctly wired in. You should allow the car to come up to temp, set the fan controllers and all should be peachy. So everything is great, but there's something you forgot. Throttle cable. Last to do will be to make sure that your throttle cable is adjusted properly. I see that most recommend the E34 throttle cable, but in my case I made an adjustable throttle cable to make sure that my pedal feel is right with the right slack. I'm not saying this is how it should be done, but do so at your own risk. So there's two things remaining here, prop shaft and the remainder of the exhaust system. All that's left to get the car to move is to get the correct length prop shaft, install it, and an exhaust system. I went to an exhaust system that came off an M50 swap T30, but my exhaust fell off, so custom it's going to be. And that's it. It's quite a bit of work, but I... You're putting something that wasn't in the first place, and it's worth it. The power gains, sound, and modern games from the engine makes it a love swap in the E30 community. And this is all you need to know on M50 swapping your E30. If you have any questions, comments, or tips that you think I or anyone should consider, especially while doing the swap, leave a comment below and let's get talking. Thank you for watching and joining me in my car journey. Be sure to like and subscribe and thank you so much once again for watching.